the next uh, speaker is Margaret Reagan or Maggie, uh, as we call her. She's uh, at Duke. Uh, she is a postdoc uh, there. She uh, was at Notre Dame previously. She is going to talk about using machine learning to determine the real discriminant locus, essentially machine learning applied to math rather than the other way around. Uh, I'll give it to Maggie. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, I'm excited to give the talk, but I also apologize um, if uh, things get a little bit discombobulated. I've been teaching for three hours this morning already on Zoom. Um, so let me know if something doesn't make sense or I skip something. Um, it's been a lot of screen time this morning. Um, so like Dagash said, my talk will be on uh, machine learning applied to the real discriminant locus, which is a concept in uh, algebraic geometry. And this is joint work that I did with Dagash, um, Edgar Bernal, John Howenstein, who is my advisor at Notre Dame, and then Ting Ting Tang, who is also a postdoc at Notre Dame and now is in California um, at a faculty position. Um, so just as an outline of what I'll be doing today is giving you some motivation on why we want to use machine learning and what we use the discriminant locus for, uh, how we go about solving this problem, a new sampling technique that we use in order to solve our problem and in order to apply this machine learning algorithm that I'll then talk about. Um, I'll introduce the results of how this turned out with two different machine learning setups and then an application into something called a real parameter homotopy. So first, many of the problems that we consider for this construction, for this project, are within science and engineering because a lot of these problems can be represented as solving a parameterized polynomial system where for these applications, what we care about is the real solutions, which are dependent on these parameter values that you input into the system. And the solutions that we care about can correspond to the equilibrium of dynamical systems. In kinematics, they can correspond to various linkages that satisfy some design constraints that you give a problem. Or in various engineering, you can for example, look at problems in computer vision and we can do some 3D reconstruction or identification of 3D objects. And so our focus is really this, this number of real solutions to our parameterized polynomial system. That is our goal is to either know how many there are or know what they are. And one of the ways that we can determine this number is we can analyze the complement of this thing called the discriminant locus in algebraic geometry. And so if we look at this picture, we're not really going to worry about what this is a picture of for right now, but we have this picture and the discriminant locus is marked by these black lines and curves. And the complement of the discriminant locus are these regions where the white region has zero solutions, the orange one has two, this uh, darker purple has four, and then the inner light purple has six. And so our first goal of this project was be, to be able to use machine, machine learning techniques to be able to calculate or locate this real discriminant locus where the classes for this classification problem in the machine learning are these number of real solutions. So these classes are the zero, two, four, and six in this example, where we want to be able to identify these boundaries, which is the supervised classification problem. And our second goal is this application that I mentioned in my outline, which is designing a real homotopy where we utilize the output from goal one and we're able to say, choose a real point in the same region and create a homotopy that tracks a smaller number of solutions because we're only looking at the real solutions rather than the entire solution set. So the first part of my talk, I'm going to focus on this goal one, where we're using these machine learning techniques to separate these classes of real solutions. 
And so our method is the following. So we use a sample method, a new sample method that's different than just an, a uniform sampling method, which I'll talk about in a second, to sample our parameter space for our parameterized polynomial system and create various testing and training data sets for our machine learning algorithm. Then we're going to use, uh, we use both a one nearest neighbor and a deep learning machine learning algorithm to then determine these decision boundaries that correspond to this real discriminant locus, which are those black lines in that picture I showed you in the previous slide. And then our third piece connects to our second goal, which is to use values within these classification boundaries to construct this efficient real parameter homotopy. And so let's first look at point one of our proposed methods. So our sampling technique. Why is this novel? Why did we go with this construction? So our sampling technique, the motivation was to come up with something besides a uniform sampling. So the uniform sampling performed poorly near the discriminant locus because this is where there are singularities. And so it didn't perform very well. And so we want to choose points that are near the, dis the discriminant locus, but not on it, well, near it, so that we can provide training data near our discriminant locus. And then our machine learning algorithm, our goal was to have it perform better with these data points that are near the boundary, because we wanted to guide this learning where it was doing poorly before. And that's supposed to say poorly, not poorly. Um, and so how do we do this? How do we come up with points that are near the boundary rather than just taking a uniform smattering of data points in our parameter space? So I'm going to describe it generally here and then we'll look at a picture in a second. First, what we do is we compute something called a pseudo witness point set for our parameterized polynomial system. We then have a uniform random sample point in our parameter space where we know the number of real solutions and we choose a random direction to move from that point and parameterize a line that intersects to give us a pseudo witness set point or point set along that line. And so what does this look like and then how does this give us our data? So this here is our line L that we have parameterized. And this is our uniform random sample point in the parameter space, which is marked by this blue rectangle in this, in this visual. And our pseudo witness point set along this line are marked by these black dots, which we can compute. We computed them using Bertini. And so what we can then do is we know that between these pseudo witness points along our line L, the number of real solutions is constant. So outside to the left along this line, this has one constant set of real solutions. Then we hit this pseudo witness set point. And so then on the inside here between before we get to this next point, there is again a constant number of real solutions. We hit another point and then there is a constant region here in terms of the number of real solutions. And so what we did is we found a midpoint between each of our pseudo witness set points. And we computed the number of real solutions at that point because it was not necessarily near the boundary. So it behaved nicely. So we were able to compute these solution sets with no problem, which were at these triangles here. These were the midpoints in our intervals marked by these pseudo witness set points. So then we then knew the number of real solutions at each of these triangles, which then meant that any point along the line between any of these pseudo witness set points that was on the same section of this line as the triangle, we could label with that same number of real solutions because that those real solutions are constant. And so these 
this diamond is a point that is perturbed from the boundary. And we know that the inner one that's on this same section as this blue triangle could be labeled with the same number of real solutions as this blue triangle. Similarly, we took a perturbation from this pseudo witness set point in the other direction. And we could label that with the same number of real solutions as this green triangle. And we could also label this other diamond that's perturbed from the second pseudo witness set point with the same number as well. And so this gave us multiple different data set types. One is just these midpoints, which we calculated the number of real solutions. Then we have these near boundary points, which are marked by these diamonds, which are perturbed from our, our pseudo witness set points, which gives us data points close to the boundary that we label with these number of real solutions from our triangles. And then we also have our uniform points, which help us create this parametrized line, which are just ra uniform random in our parameter space. And so these are what we used as our training and testing data sets for our machine learning algorithms. And now I will discuss what those were. So one section or type of machine learning algorithm that we chose to use was a k-nearest neighbor. And so the method chooses k neighbors associated with the point in the training set via this Euclidean distance to test the sample point and assign a label to that sample point or to that test point that corresponds to the majority of the k nearest neighbors. So in our case, if we have 10 neighbors and eight of them had two real solutions, then we'd label it with two real solutions. Now we chose for our method to be a one nearest neighbor method. And this is because we had the lowest misclassification error, which comes to this theorem that we are able to prove or that we had within our paper, which says that as long as we sample our parameter, a parameter space densely enough, then no other classifier besides this one nearest neighbor classification algorithm will perform better for determining this number of real solutions. And the, the reason for this and the proof of this, you can look in our paper for a little bit more detail, but it has to do with this Bayes error rate where the, uh, the, the Bayes error rate, the best possible for any classifier is zero. And here we end up having a, a rate of zero because we have no overlapping classes. And so the one nearest neighbor method performs the best here. So we, that is what we employed. Another technique within machine learning was a deep learning algorithm, specifically a feed forward neural network, which has this multi-layer structure, which is a composition of activation functions. And there are different weights or network parameters that you have to choose appropriately for this multi-layer network. And without the one, without being the one who actually set up this this algorithm, generally what you do is to, to determine what these weights or parameters should be, you usually choose an overabundance of these parameters and then apply some sort of optimization that then best approximates your underlying function, your constrained target function. And in, the usual sense, a lot of times they end up using regularization because overfitting is typical because of any noise that you might find in your data. However, because of the data that we're working with, we know this, the number of real solutions, we can certify that these are computed solution sets to our parameterized polynomial system. So there is no noise. So our algorithm for the feed forward neural network did not need to use this regularization that is normally used within these constructions. And so that's what makes it a little bit different than what is traditionally used in many machine learning cases. 
So let's look at how these various approaches worked for some examples. And we'll start with an illustrative example where we know what this boundary for the discriminant locus should be. Namely, we have this equation, this boundary between the number of real solutions should be defined by 4b cubed plus 27c squared is equal to zero. That marks this, this curve right here. And it separates the regions where you have three real solutions and one real solution. And so here we took a uniform random sampling of the date of the parameter space here. This is our uniform data set. And then on the right, you see that there's this near boundary data. So this is the data that's perturbed on either side of our discriminant locus, our boundary. And so then we applied, we use these data sets and applied our machine learning algorithm to see whether or not we could locate this decision boundary. And when we trained with uniform data and we tested with uniform data, it did well. But when we trained with uniform data and added any boundary data or near boundary data, that's just off of that uh, decision boundary. The accuracy of the, of the algorithm severely decreased. So we weren't able to as correctly identify or correctly label these points with a number of real solutions. However, when we trained with near boundary data or near boundary and those midpoint data, so it, as long as our training data contained some of this near boundary data that was perturbed, we were very accurate and able in being able to identify and label the number of real solutions for our testing data sets. And this was for the one nearest neighbor method. So let's look at how it performed with the feed forward neural network. And it, so it really looks the same. So we have a similar case in that when we train with uniform and test with any near boundary data, the performance declines. Whereas if we use any of this near boundary data to uh, train and then we test with any of our various data, we're able to correctly label our data, our test data points with this number of real solutions. We're able to correctly classify. Excuse me. And so let's look at uh, the results for this feed for our network in a visual. So this correctly identified all of these points in here and we're able to separate those of one solution and three solutions. So it labeled those points. And if you remember, this matches what we expect. And so let's look at a, at a different example where it's a little bit more complicated. Let's look at the three oscillator Kuramoto model. So that's something that we've used as many examples, but it might not be as common to you. So what is the Kuramoto model? So the Kuramoto model studies synchronization uh, for coupled oscillators. So in this case, we're talking about three oscillators, so n equals three. So we can th think about this in terms of like the light of fireflies or rhythmic applause or metronomes, thing, anything that has a natural frequency of oscillation. And so we study the number of these equilibria as a function of the parameters, which are the natural frequencies of these oscillators. So this W omega one and omega two. And so those are the parameters that define our parameter space that we will be sampling. Where this is the polynomial system that defines our equilibria. And so we again have to start with computing our sample data. So on the left here, we can see our uniform random sample data that we have. And then on the right, we have a zoomed in picture of our perturbed data perturbed from this boundary. 
And if you recognize, it's somewhat hard to see in these pictures, but this is this first picture that I talked about at the very beginning of my talk when I outlined the goals. So this is the discriminant locus of the Kermodo n equals three case. And so how did this perform with our two various machine learning approaches? We find the same thing happens as with the illustrative cubic case. When we train with uniform data, but test with any data near the boundary, our accuracy severely declines. But when we make sure to train with any of the data that's near our boundary, it helps guide our learning. And we see that the accuracy stays very high when we test with any of our various data sets, whether that be uniform or whether it have any of this near boundary data in it. And so this is specifically for the feed forward network, but we also see this behavior for the one neural network or the one nearest neighbor network. And so let's see a visual. So the feed forward neural network computed the following decision boundaries that you can see in this picture. And we can see that this matches the picture that I showed you at the very beginning of the talk where we have that discriminant locus mapped out in black. And so let's now switch to discussing how this might, uh, how we can use this information of being able to take sample data that contains near boundary data. We can use machine learning to accurately provide these decision boundaries for the discriminant locus, accurately classify the number of real solutions. And then we want to apply it to goal number two, which is to be able to solve for the real solution set by drastically reducing this computation time. So the reason this comes up is in many problems, I'm going to talk, let's talk about a problem in computer vision, for example, there can be 300 solutions, there could be 200 something solutions or even more. And most of those solutions end up not being real. So when we talk about actually the solutions that we want to use for the application, the number of real solutions that we actually care about or are important to us is much smaller than the total number of solutions for the parametrized polynomial system. And so if in this case, you can just solve for the real solution set by starting with a real solution set and, and moving via parameter homotopy, then you change the number of paths that you're following for the, to find the solution set by a very large amount, by a drastic amount, which would inherently reduce your computation time. And so what do we do? to be able to do this, to be able to use this parameter, parameter homotopy method. So below in this picture, you can see that we have this classification or this classification boundary that was determined previously by, by our feed forward neural network, machine learning algorithm using our sampling technique. Well, we have any we can choose a parameter in our parameter space that's in one of these boundaries we can have it it's part of our training data and we can then find or sorry we take a parameter that we want to solve for the number of real solutions and we find using the one nearest neighbor method our parameter p star that's in our training data we already have the number of real solutions there. We already, we can compute what these solutions already are. We have computed them. And then you can, so let's say that this here is P star and it was the nearest point for whatever reason to our P, which is down here. And we can then perform a parameter homotopy between these two points where we're only tracking two real solutions that exist here, rather than for this problem, uh, there are six total solutions. So the difference between tracking six and two. And so that maybe isn't as, as drastic, but it's still something. And so we can see the results here. 
where we look at the number of data points that we have, the number of paths that we have to track, and then how long it takes us. So for the number of paths for two, four, and six, so this is for the three oscillator Kuramoto model, this took about, I believe it was about half of the time that it would take to track all six paths if we did our, our general homotopy from uh, parameter homotopy for all six solutions. And the success rate was 100%. So when we talk about success rate, I'll go back to this picture previously very quickly, is if we had a parameter point here and somehow the closest neighbor P star was over here, then we'd cross over this decision boundary, which would count as, as a failure in this case. And so we did the same thing for the n equals four oscillator model. So we now have three parameters that we're looking at. And we looked at the number of various number of paths. Again, the speed increase was, I think it was a factor of 10 for this one, if I'm remembering correctly, with again, a much higher or a very high success rate with the idea being that we are seeing a, an improvement in time, even for these small problems where the difference in number of real solution paths versus the total number of solution paths is relatively small. And so if we're seeing a reasonable improvement in this timing, then the improvement when you only have maybe 10 real solutions, but there are a total of 300 something total solutions, then that timing improvement would be that drastic where we're still seeing a, a large success rate, which is good. And so just as a summary, we proposed a method that takes a novel sampling method to involve points near the decision boundaries to help guide learning so that we can apply machine learning techniques to train and test a system that formulates this uh, parameterized polynomial system solving for the discriminant locus as a classification problem and helps us find these decision boundaries. And then that location, knowing that location of the decision boundaries and being able to classify points based on their number of real solutions, we can then use that information for a real parameter homotopy to drastically reduce computation time while still having an accurate and efficient method. And in the future, we're hoping to apply active learning techniques to be able to explore problems in higher dimension. For example, we didn't have a convergent method for the neural network for the four oscillator Kuramoto model, and then to be able to potentially extend even further beyond that. So thank you. And if you'd like to read our paper, it's on archive here. Um, and of course, you can ask us any questions. I think most of us for this paper in this in this room. So. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Maggie.